Um, okay, well, welcome everyone to our session on soils and soil testing. I'm Sue Eric, Director of the Maine Soil Testing Service and Analytical Laboratory. And we also have Bruce Hoskins with us, who's uh, the Assistant Scientist in the Soil Testing Service. Um, he's the day-to-day -day manager, and some of you, if you've, if you've called into the lab or dropped off a sample, maybe you've met Bruce before, he'll be monitoring the chat box and he'll be helping to answer any questions. So I have about a 20-minute presentation um, about our lab services, about soils and why they're really important, and then kind of at the end some rather specific info about our methods and our procedures and a couple of video clips of our instruments and how they work to analyze soils. So I am just going to um, share my screen. So I started with a picture of Deering Hall. This is our physical location on the University of Maine campus. We have some labs on the fourth floor, on the second floor, and in the basement. So we're spread across the building. Um, our website is listed here. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about the website because it's really a great source of information. And we are funded by the Maine Agricultural and Forest Experiment Station. I have their website there as well. Both Bruce and I and all the other people who work in the lab are members of the School of Food and Agriculture, which is one of the units within the College of Natural Sciences, Forestry, and Agriculture. So here's the home page for our um, labs website and, and there's just a lot of information here if questions come up um, come into your mind that don't get answered today or maybe next week you think of a question this would be a great place to, to take a look and see if the information is here so I want to point out a couple specific things on this website the home page here that you land on has kind of the most um, up-to-date information kind of the the um, things that are really notable that, that uh, people might want to know if they land on our website. And for the past few months, one of the things that's been very notable and a question is whether we're open for business or not. We have been continuously open for face-to-face -face business. So back in March, the University of Maine um, did not shut down, but many faculty and staff and students went remote and were no longer on campus. But that wasn't true of our lab. What we do has to be done in the lab and we continue to do it. We were permitted to continue safe operation. We developed a safety plan and received permission to keep working because we're an important part of the food system in Maine, an important resource. So we are open for business. We have been open for business. Um, we have uh, a, a drop-off site for samples outside Deering Hall, and we're asking that people who might want to come in person maybe just drop their samples off outside rather than bringing them into the building. And it's certainly fine to continue mailing us samples as well. There's also information here about um, uh, different times of the year, different tests may be appropriate or different things to keep uh, thinking about. And that information will be on the website as well. So if you click on this price tab, you'll get a complete price list for the lab and that will show you everything we do, all the analyses that we offer and the prices. Request soil test kits. If you click right here, you can input your name and address and we'll mail out to you um, a box that you can put your soil in to mail back to us and all the paperwork that you would need to submit a sample. So that's a, a, a good tab to know about. Uh, here on the left hand column, you can click here for information about our quality control procedures, the equipment that we have in the lab, more information about recommendations that we provide. Um, what we don't do is actually a helpful tab to uh, click on. So we do not uh, provide any pesticide testing. We don't analyze plant disease samples or pest samples. Um, and, and there's a, a number of other services that we don't provide that you might be interested in, but we have links here. So we point you in the right direction for getting some of those other analyses done, even though our lab doesn't do them. The frequently asked questions is a good tab as well. If you have a question, it might well be something that's come up before and you might get the information that you need right here. There's a number of topics there that, that are just common questions. Preparing your garden soil video. So this was a video made by Cooperative Extension. We're not um, really formally linked to Cooperative Extension, but we work very often with extension specialists all throughout the state. And this video is prepared by a couple of different extension staff. 
And then our contact information, it's both here and here. So ways to get in touch with um, Bruce, with me, um, with Suzanne Perone, who's another staff member in the lab. So that is um, a very quick uh, run through of our website. And again, there's lots of useful information here. We are a fee-for-service facility. We test soils and there's a number of different types of soil tests we offer. Today I'm going to be talking mostly about the standard soil test, the basics of soil testing. Um, we ought, do offer some other options, several of which include the standard soil test plus, plus some additional information. We test plant tissue, we test um, residuals like manure and compost, and we test water, not drinking water um, per se, but we do test water for certain elements. We don't test for any kind of pathogen, so we can't tell you if you have E. coli in your well water. And again, here's the website address for the price list, which gives you a really comprehensive list of what we do. So our customer base is um, a large one. We do analyze research samples from students and staff at the University of Maine, from other colleges and universities, and researchers from federal agencies such as the Forest Service, the Agricultural Research Service, and the National Park Service. And then maybe one of our, our biggest uh, and uh, most significant sectors of customers is growers all across Maine, potato, blueberry, apples, dairy, diversified vegetables, grains. Um, it, almost anybody who's growing anything in Maine um, is likely to be one of our customers. We provide services for specialized kinds of growers like high tunnel producers, people who are growing within a high tunnel um, or hoop house type system. We typically analyze 500 or more per year of those kinds of samples. And a, a, another big significant part of our customer base is home gardeners. We have over 3000 samples typically from home gardeners every year. And then a, a variety of other types of customers, towns, K-12 schools, sanitation districts, consulting firms. Typically, we analyze over 16,000 soil samples per year, 250 compost samples, 500 um, or more manure samples, as well as the other types of material that we analyze. And the pandemic has been, just like for everyone, the pandemic has been very challenging for our laboratory. So we, we now are operating under um, special protocols to keep all our staff safe. Um, but we are continuing to operate and it's been interesting. It seemed to us that the pandemic is actually increasing public interest in growing food and ornamental plants at home. So people are home, they're interested in growing things at home. They might send a sample in for a soil test, and they are sending samples in for soil tests. And Definitely, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and people are um, also interested in, you know, buying local food from Maine growers, and that's great for Maine growers and also helps our customer base as well. So it's the pandemic has been interesting for all of us. Okay, I just wanna pivot briefly for the next couple of slides away from our lab specifically and talk a little bit more about soils in general. Um, what is healthy soil is a question that both soil scientists and growers and other people are asking right now. And it's a, it's a, a good question, it's a research question really. And this slide is a schematic from a very recent paper from this year that was about soil health. And it shows a number of the different um, uh, areas where soils touch human society and soils contribute to human society. Soils are an underappreciated resource. Really, we don't always realize that there are many, many ways in which they provide services, soils provide services to human society. And this slide also has the definition of a healthy soil. This would be the one that a soil scientist would probably give. A healthy soil has the continued capacity to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. So healthy soil has the idea that it's sustaining um, human society as well as plants and animals, and then it's going to continue to be able to do that and function in the future. So a lot of times when we think of soils, we're definitely thinking about crop production and quality and a lot of our customers are as well, and that's a very important function of soils. 
Soils also um, influence groundwater quality and surface water quality and what's happening in the soil really has a lot to do with, with water quality. Soils influence climate and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in a minute and soils influence human health very directly and I'll talk about that in a minute as well. So we have a question okay. from, uh, from Tammy. Okay. Uh, do the soil test results include recommendations to improve the soil? And yes, definitely we do make recommendations for um, not only soil chemistry, but also for improving soil quality, particularly uh, organic matter content in the soil um, and organic matter quality. So yeah, and recommendations are included with every routine soil test that we run, yes. And one of the last slides I have is actually a picture of our results and recommendation form. So I may just ask Bruce to take a couple minutes when we get to that slide and highlight some of the information that you get, not only the recommendations, but also the results as well, because that's a, it's a good question and it's a common question. And we'll, we'll kind of end up there. So um, the, the services that soils provide to humans, I uh, put them into four broad categories that are really important. Sustainable plant production, water quality, human health, and climate change. And management, so one of the common recommendations that we give is for nutrients, new added nutrients that your soil might need to increase plant productivity. And that's an important management tool, helps increase plant yield. But the, um, concern, I guess, is that too much nitrogen and phosphorus can actually decrease water quality. So some of these management steps that we take to um, enhance some of these services actually need to be considered pretty carefully because they may cause some negative effects on some of the other services and some of the other things we want soils to be able to do, like provide good quality water and preserve water quality. Um, human health improvement here, um, just to mention specifically a couple of, uh, a couple of areas there. So uh, human health, it really is tied to soils and people don't always realize that or think about it. A lot of the common antibiotics that we use were developed from microorganisms in soils. And then toxins in soils can have a negative effect on human health. Toxins such as lead, arsenic, and some other trace elements and our lab can analyze for some of those and we do really commonly uh, and analyze for lead and Bruce may want to talk about this a little bit more later. Um, and then finally climate change mitigation. So when we're trying to inc increase plant production, one of the ways to do that is to add more organic matter to soils. Organic matter has um, some great qualities. It holds nutrients, it holds water. It's generally a very positive thing to increase plant yield. And it also potentially has some very positive impacts on climate change. So organic matter stores a lot of carbon. Organic matter in soils is about 50% carbon. If you took all the carbon in the atmosphere and added to all the carbon in soils, that would still be less than the carbon that's held in soils in this form of stable soil organic matter. And soils are very connected to the climate system. So the climate um, warming that we're experiencing and the climate change is really connected to uh, CO2, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We're putting it into the atmosphere very rapidly when we combust fossil fuels. Well, carbon dioxide comes from the soil and in a natural process at a much slower rate. And carbon dioxide also goes into the soil when plants grow, when their roots grow, and when soil organic matter is formed and stabilized, some of the CO2 from the atmosphere gets sort of pulled into the soil and stabilized into the soil. The more we can promote that process, the less CO2 there'll be in the atmosphere. And researchers are actually studying whether that could be a way to mitigate climate change. Um, to enhance levels of soil organic matter in soils. And that would be a really good thing for most producers because their soils would be more productive for many people, many growers, if they had more organic matter in them. I'm um, just going to briefly, briefly talk about where we are in climate change now. It's a, it is a really important issue for Maine. Climate models predict that the Northeast, including Maine, is going to get warmer and wetter 
and we can see that that's happening. So this is a, a graph of average annual temperature from 1895 when we started keeping records up to 2019. And you can see there's a lot of up and down from year to year. Some years are warmer, some years are colder, but the average annual temperature um, fluctuates around um, an average value. And we've seen an increase in average annual temperature value of about three degrees in the 125 years that we've been keeping records. And something similar with precipitation. So average annual precipitation up and down from year to year. This is again from 1890 to 2019. Um, some years are wetter and some years like this year, very dry, lots of flu fluctuation up and down. But basically we've seen an increase of about six inches. So Maine is definitely getting warmer and wetter and those changes have a lot of consequences um, to human society and certainly to soils and soil processes. So if we could slow down that process, if we could pull some of the carbon out of the atmosphere, lock it up in soil organic matter, that might be a really good strategy um, to employ and it would be one that would help producers as well. So now to, to come back again to some of the very specific things that our lab does, I wanna introduce that with a, Another question, how do we know if soil is healthy? We just talked about what is healthy soil and what are the important things that soil does. Well, how do we know if we have a particular soil in our field or our garden, how do we know if that soil is healthy or not? Well, as it turns out, that is a really good question. There's a lot of debate um, about how to measure soil health, a lot of debate. And chemical, physical, and biological properties of soil are all being suggested and being studied as possible indicators of soil health. So we need some things that we can measure to tell us whether soil is healthy or not. And our lab falls pretty squarely in the box of chemical properties. So if you send in a sample to get a standard soil test from our lab, you would get information about soil nutrients, soil pH, soil organic matter and carbon levels. And all of those different parameters are being suggested as possible um, tools or parameters that would be useful to put your soil on a scale somewhere between not so healthy and more healthy. Um, soil organic matter is turning out to be a really very important parameter to measure if you want to talk about soil health. So soil organic matter not only stores carbon, which I just talked about, has a lot of nutrients, a lot of water holding capacity. It influences both physical <clears throat> and biological properties. It influences water storage, aggregation, microbial biomass, some of the other properties that are clearly connected to soil health. So it's a very key indicator. Um, Sue, I would, uh, I would add that we do do a complete soil health um, test. That's one of our optional soil tests that includes not just chemistry, but also physical and biological properties. It's one of the extra, extra type test packages that we do provide on request. Um, so we do address that for those who have the time and want to spend a little extra, we, we, we can do that for you. Yeah, yeah thank you, Bruce. And, and there is a lot of interest in soil health, so we do have some demand for that test, for sure. Um, so standard soil testing, I want to come back and, and again, Bruce, <coughs> add more information to some parts of this, but I wanted to just give you the very basics and briefly talk about soil testing, the standard soil test that we offer, which is the most, most common test that we do. So it starts with our customers collecting a representative soil sample. And we have information on our website and also the information that we send you with the soil test kit. We'll talk about how to collect a representative soil sample. Um, fall is a great time to collect a soil sample. Um, Bruce and I were just talking before the session started about the fact that we're getting quite a lot of samples into the lab now, which happens in the fall for sure. Um, spring is also another really busy season for us as people send in soil samples before planting, but after harvest also another good time. So it's a, it's a representative soil sample. Usually that means um, several different samples from the field or the garden mixed together and subsampled and sent to us. And then when we get those samples, we 
treat them, we dry them, air dry them. Sometimes we have to crush them, we sieve them, we homogenize them so they're very well mixed. And then we extract a plant available fraction of nutrients. And we do that using standardized conditions with the same extracting solution and the same ratio of soil to solution, shaking time, shaking speed for every sample. And then we filter them. And then we take those extracts and they are analyzed for nutrients of interest, calcium, magnesium, potassium, phosphorus, sulfur, and some micronutrients. They're analyzed for soil pH and they are analyzed for soil organic matter content. And we can come back and talk about the specifics of those procedures if we want to. And Bruce would be a good person to talk about those if anyone wants more information. Um, we do not measure, and this is a surprise for some folks, we don't, do not measure plant available nitrogen in the extract. Nitrogen is a very uh, labile nutrient. It changes a lot over the course of the growing season. So how much available nitrogen is there early in the spring or late in the fall isn't always that informative. Um, so we, but we do offer some specialized nitrogen testing options. So if we want, again, if we want to talk more about that, um, we certainly can. But the basics is nutrient analysis, soil pH and organic matter. And this picture um, shows you a little bit about how we extract soils. So the top half is the kind of extracting rack. So these flasks have soil and extracting solution in them, and they can all be shaken on a shaker for a standard amount of time. And then they can be upended and poured into the fun funnels and filter papers down below. So the, each individual soil and its extract are dumped into those, uh, those uh, funnels. The filter paper catches the soil and then the clear solution drips down into the test tube. And here's the extract that we actually analyze. And I'm going, we'll see how well this works. I'm going to show you a couple of video clips of how the, the analysis works and a couple of the specialized pieces of equipment that we have in our lab. So this is our ICP, our inductively coupled plasma emission spectrophotometer. So here are the test tubes all lined up in a rack. And here's our auto sampler, and it's going to sample those extract solutions. And let's see how well this goes. And the solutions are being sucked up by that auto sampler and then carried into the um, center part of the instrument into this plasma. So this is a very hot uh, uh, environment and the different elements that are in the solution will emit light at characteristic wavelengths and the computer will quantify those, those emissions, how much is being emitted for, by each element and that translates to um, how much of that element was in the extract solution. That's a very simplified explanation of how that works and we can elaborate more on that if people are interested. This is our automated system for measuring pH. These cups contain soil and water or soil in a buffer solution. The buffer solution helps us make lime recommendations for you. If your soil is very acid, it may, may need more lime and we make those recommendations based on the results of this test. These are electrodes that will go down into the cups and measure pH. So you can see that. The, solutions here at the right are standard uh, solutions that are used to standardize the electrodes and they dip down into the cups and are actually measuring the soil. So is it, are people seeing those video clips? Is it visible? If you're on my end. Okay, good. Should have asked, but I was hoping that it would work. So our final instrument here is our LECO carbon analyzer. And this is our very precise method of determining soil carbon. This is not part of the standard soil test. We use a different method for estimating organic matter. Um, that's a, a loss on ignition method for that. This might be for research samples or, or often it's for research samples. Um, people looking at soil carbon and wanting to know very precisely the amount 
So the, the Lika basically is a furnace. This part of the instrument is a very hot furnace. And this is the sample boat. And you're going to see um, a sample boat get ejected from the furnace and this new sample boat being put into the furnace. When the, and the boat has soil in it. When the boat gets inside, it's heated to a very hot temperature um, above 1,000 degrees C and it's combusted, all the organic matter in there is turned into CO2, and that CO2 is measured. So here's how it goes. So this looks kind of simple, but it's a very complex uh, machine to keep operational. We have a very experienced operator who works on this machine and keeps it going. So that boat is uh, 1,350 centigrade. So you don't touch those for a while when they come out. <laughs> it dumps down, you'll see it dump into the bin yeah. it can cool down. So all the carbon in that sample was or changed to CO2 and it was measured. The second sample went in and the instrument kind of closes up and then that sample gets heated. So I, I'm wondering, Bruce, whether you wanted to um, maybe say a few words about the result and recommendation form. Would that be okay? I don't mean to put you on. Oh, sure. No, that's fine. Uh, there's a couple of questions from the chat box that we need to catch up with. Okay. Um, from Libby, uh, do you find an increase in soil tests due to COVID-19 and folks wanting to become more self-sufficient? And that definitely, um, uh, that's what we're seeing a considerable increase both from the general public, a lot of first-time gardeners, uh, established gardeners um, wanting to maximize their output and especially some of our commercial vegetable growers who are just absolutely swamped with local food um, demand. Uh, they want to maximize productivity. So we're getting quite an increase from all of our different customer groups, um, um, at least as some I'm sure it has something to do with uh, COVID-19 and everyone being locked at home and <laughs> um, and everyone buying local, which is great for our local producers. And Tammy asks, are there certain issues with soils in Maine that you see commonly in your soil test? Uh, and how long does it take to get results? So I can address that when we go over uh, just a routine uh, standard soil test report. But this, this is an example of um, we do have, well, there we see a, a, a huge range of, of test results uh, from people. Every sample is different. Um, there's a, a general interpretation up here in these bar graphs, color coded bar graphs, pH, organic matter are up here. The major nutrients are in green, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. Uh, and the micronutrients are color coded in blue, boron, copper, iron, manganese, and zinc. These are all essential plant nutrients. Uh, for the test where we do run nitrogen, that would show up here on this one blank line. So that's, that's our comprehensive soil test. This is a standard soil test. So you, just a visual interpretation you get on every report. Um, <clears throat> the interpretation scale is scaled off this optimum range here and there's a low, medium, optimum range, and then above optimum. So above optimum means there's more than you need really for ideal plant production. But the recommendations down here are specifically designed to bring these test levels up in the optimum range, but not in the above optimum range. So we want to avoid this as much as possible for environmental purposes, especially with phosphorus and nitrogen, uh, phosphorus being one of the most sensitive nutrients. So we're making recommendations to improve your soil, but no more. And when you don't need any more phosphorus or you don't need any more potassium, we won't be recommending anymore. Um, so <clears throat> common problems in Maine, some are low pH, some are high pH, depends on how intensively you're managing your garden or your fields. Um, and you know, we're making recommendations for nitrogen, even though we're not directly testing for it because it is a transient nutrient. Uh, <clears throat> we do a lot of comprehensive tests that include nitrate 
a direct measurement during the growing season, which is the time of the year when it makes most sense to, to spend the extra $7 for the nitrate test. <clears throat> and we can make a, a much better um, interpretation at that point about whether you need extra nitrogen or not. And that's something that you can put on during the growing season. It doesn't have to be all applied before, before planting. Um, <clears throat> low organic matter uh, is addressed down here by including uh, cow manure, compost, leaves. It's addressed down here at the bottom. Of the, they're all good sources of organic matter to improve the carbon content of your soil to feed your beneficial microbes um, and to generally improve your soil's nutrient water holding capacity. Uh, if you do have access to animal manures, there's some obviously some nutrient content and there's a rough equivalence for, um, for um, how much you can decrease these more expensive concentrated nutrient sources up here. But this is our organic garden recommendation system where we're giving you two or three choices for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium from non-chemical nutrient sources that are still concentrated sources of these nutrients. And if you really want to geek out, uh, you can look down here at the bottom for the actual numerical results. Uh, the, the level found and directly underneath at the optimum range. Um, so ideally for a garden somewhere between six and seven, we target 6.5 and that's how much lime you need from the water and buffer um, pH measurements uh, to get you right up to 6.5. And um, these are what you need to optimize your nutrient levels. And then turnaround time, I think. Oh, the turnaround time, yes. It takes about two weeks. We do weekly batches, so whatever comes in during the week up to Friday, we run as a batch the following week. So maximum turnaround time would be about two weeks. Uh, if it comes in on a Friday, it's more like 10 days. It'll be run the following week. And we typically mail out and email out the following Monday uh, after the previous week's run. Yeah, and speaking of email out, um, here's our, our report form that would be submitted when you actually submit a soil sample. We need to know what, what you're planning to grow, um, for sure, because recommendations are crop specific. And then here's uh, the option, you have the option to put in your email address if you would like to have your results emailed to you and that, that makes things a little bit quicker. People are usually pretty eager to get their results. And please print clearly <laughs> the email, uh, your email address because we, it, uh, we do mail out paper copies for everything just in case the email doesn't go through. And this is the form that you would get when you request a soil test kit and on the back of um, this form, there's information about how to take that representative soil sample because that's really where it all starts. You won't get good quality information if you don't send us a sample that's really representative of your soil. Um, so, you know, pay, be sure to take a look at that. Um, Libby wants to know if, if um, uh, students are running the tests. Um, and we do have student helpers, but we, we have a regular full-time staff, very experienced staff, uh, who's running uh, all the analysis. We work the students in and give them some hands-on experience as much as possible, but um, all of our soil tests are run uh, by regular full-time staff. Okay, were there any other questions that came to mind for people? Um, we'd be happy to to continue or finish up, whatever works. Um, we get uh, we get a lot of questions from gardeners uh, how to how to interpret the results. I mean, for our experienced growers, they're used to our test; they they know what to expect. But if you're a first time gardener, don't be afraid of asking questions. We we, we do uh, provide as much uh, reference material as possible. Uh, we do just basic re reference material with each report that goes out. Um, and um, our website has a lot of, uh, of information, especially under uh, uh, understanding recommendations tab on our homepage. There's a lot of information out there on um, 
natural organic fertilizers, um, soil health, um, soil health testing, soil health interpretation, uh, what you can do to improve the health of your soil. Um, just there's a lot of just short informational forms out there that, that answer common questions that we get here. Um, so there's a lot of information on the website um, uh, under the understanding recommendations tab. And I would point people to that uh, first. And then certainly if you have any other questions, give us a call. It's not a problem. Um, in any cooperative extension office, there's one in every county or that covers every county. And we work very closely with cooperative extension. So um, we're just a, a general public outreach team for the University of Maine. Great. So thank you, Bruce. I think that that might be a good or a very good note to end on, okay. actually, unless there are other questions. I think that, uh, okay. Yes, thank you, Libby. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Thank you, Tammy. Thanks for coming.